at the age of like four or five. In the Ice Age, Britain had lions, bears, woolly mammoths. Oh, no! <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to the Pod, the show that brings professionals in cultural heritage directly to you. As always, this episode is brought to you by Safe Cultural Heritage Group. I'm your host, Megan Kamorik, and I am an archaeologist and ecologist currently based in London. Today we are joined by a paleontologist who recently got their MA researching something I think is really cool, but let's see what you guys think. It is the spatial distribution of spotted hyena dens during the middle and late Pleistocene in Britain. But here to explain more about that and then some. <laughs> Hi. Hello, Jenna. Welcome to I'm so talk. excited to be here. That's yeah, because <laughs> I'm really excited to have you. I wore like velociraptor earrings just because I was like, come on, I had to. Amazing. Yeah, I have <laughs> so many dinosaur jewelry. Like, I've got a dinosaur skirt, you know, I've got everything, but I just haven't been wearing them today. I was like, oh no, I forgot all about it. So, yeah, kudos for the velociraptor. Come back for our game. You can just like get on a oh, full on dinosaur. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Outfit changes for this episode. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for those of those who are watching and obviously for yourself as well, this episode as always is broken up into three segments. So we're going to have our lovely introduction followed by a QA. and a I promise I won't ask too many questions. Never mind, I can't promise that. I'm fascinated and ready to go. <laughs> um, then obviously we're going to play a game which I think you're going to like. I'm only going to tell you the name of it and it's called Fossil Field Trip. So Ooh, you okay. do. Yeah. And then finally we just fill up my carpet to you. You can tell us where to find you, anything that you have interesting going on, and whatever else you want to shout, shout out. So if that sounds good, you ready? Yeah, that sounds great. Excellent. Well then, tell us more about um, you, Jenna. So, hi everyone, my name is Jenna. I'm 23 and I'm from the United Kingdom, more specifically Manchester. Um, and I fell in love with paleontology at the age of like four or five. Um, my parents used to take me to the museum all the time and it was always the paleontology section that I went to straight away you know didn't care about the Egyptology section sorry that's fine <laughs> I know that my dad absolutely loves Egyptology and he was always like no no let's go to the Egyptology class but no always straight to the dinosaurs straight to the fossils you know um, and then I kind of went through high school and I got to I think it was about about 14 15 and um, our careers counsellor was like paleontology isn't a girl subject you should do something more girly which I know is such a massive like offence so they were like you should do um you know psychology or veterinary studies and I'm like yeah that's great but I actually love paleontology it's what I want to do so yeah and I went to uni went I came down to Portsmouth which is where I am now um because I've got a job here I'm not I've kind of taken a break from paleo but I'll get to that in a sec so I did my undergraduate here in Portsmouth um I did I, I just it was amazing honestly can't recommend it enough um <laughs> and then I came back up to Manchester to do my MPhil degree so that's my master's in philosophy I think but it's in paleontology <laughs> um and that's where I'm at today I'm graduating I think in April with it um but due to Covid you know the one year degree kind of turned into two and a half nearly three years um but yeah I think everyone's the exact same with Covid um and now I'm currently a science technician at a school so I've set up practicals and um you know help teachers inspire kids to do science so I've got a kid at work who really wants to be a cosmo cosmologist yeah cosmo not, the, not the makeup one the space one <laughs> Um, I was getting really mixed up and I'm like yeah you can do it like let's help you get to where you are you know so I'm trying to help people kind of build up that relationship with science um I am planning on doing a PhD at some point but yeah <laughs> so um with my MPhil degree I um studied um the spatial distribution of spotted hyenas during the Pleistocene in Britain so what this entails really is um modern so spotted hyenas we all know and love is you know the the laughers the um the antagonists in the lion king you know and i just love them you know they're just great animals <laughs> and, um, 
I, I don't know this, I just find them so cool and when this project rose I was like yes I have to do this one and um what it is is that so during the Pleistocene which was the um oh uh, which so the Pleistocene we kind of all know is the Ice Age so during the Ice Age Britain had um lions bears woolly mammoths and other elephants depending on time zone not time zones um isotope stages um I imagine well, if it was time zone just like oh nope we're in the yep. winter time zone right now mm -hmm. we don't have sorry any. only only <laughs> woolly mammoths are in this time zone so during the Pleistocene, we have these things called marine isotope stages and what they are are um oh my god my brain, brain's gone blank they are um, like time periods that are characterized by specific fauna and also by glacial interglacial periods. So um, we have hyenas from um, MIS, which is marine isotope stage. Um, I think it's 21. So what we do is we work back in time. And so interglacials are always um, odd numbers, glacials are even. So what we are currently is in the MIS one on present day, because we're in currently an interglacial. Um, which is, is really cool. <laughs> um, but previous interglacials um, used to have hyenas, um, bison, hippos. We had hippos in the Thames, which I always, it That's absolutely so cool. flabbergasts me that 125,000 years ago, we had hippos up to about Yorkshire. Like in the, yeah, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> So yeah, so hyenas are the, one of the main um, carnivores during the Pleistocene in Britain and throughout all of Europe, really. So um, what I did is I was looking at cave deposits um, because caves are just amazing for um, like preserving stuff. So, um, you know, these bones come out and it looks like they were just there yesterday. And with these, um, with hyena bones, so not bones, with hyenas, they used to be done in caves just because it's what was available really. And what I did was go through all the caves in Britain, really, um, and try to identify whether hyenas A, done there, and then B, what kind of den they were. So um, researchers have suggested that there are three types of dens. Um, one was a natal den, which is where they would give birth. Um, a communal den, which is where everyone would kind of come together and do hyena things. <laughs> and then three is one that's only found in the Pleistocene um, during cold periods, and that is prey depot. So prey depot dens were like storage areas. So, you know, like a pantry, it's basically yeah. the hyena's pantry. And so the the aim originally was to go to all these localities and try and look and identify and go to loads of museums and and it kind of ended up because of covid being a um like a literature review mainly and um using museum catalogs to identify so quite a lot of it is interpretation um so yeah uh that yeah so i managed to find like I studied about 85 localities overall, wow. which is really cool. Yeah, um, quite a lot of in, in England, some in Wales. There's only one in Ireland with presence of spotted hyenas and none in Scotland. And we like to think that, it, well, we like to think, we think it's because the um, hyenas just couldn't get past that latitude. And it's found kind of across Europe that around the latitude that Edinburgh is, so Edinburgh up, and like Norway, Sweden, that sort of place. The hyenas just couldn't cross into. It was just too cold. They just weren't adapted. And it's great. It's really interesting. So I kind of went into it kind of going, oh yeah, they probably won't be there. Let's just have a look anyway. And they weren't. So yeah. Um, and so in this study, we found loads of really cool, interesting things. Like before COVID hit, I started doing a few bits of museum work. And I went to Manchester Museum, which has this amazing collection and I just can't recommend it enough I mean it's my local museum but it's just amazing <laughs> and um so there's a locality quite near to Manchester it's on the Derbyshire Nottinghamshire border and it's called Creswell Crags it's amazing it's just this limestone gorge there's loads of caves there and hyenas have been found there so 
in the Manchester Museum collections, we've got loads and loads of material from there. And we have found what we believe to be the first evidence of um, nibbling sticks, which are these tiny, tiny little bones. <laughs> it's so, it sounds so sweet. Tiny little bones that um, baby hyenas would have gnawed on to develop their mastic masticatory, masticatory systems. So hyenas have these really, really nice skulls where they have this really big sagittal crest here which is where the jaw attachments would have attached and it's just they are huge and that is because of the bone crushing capabilities yeah so these, i'm just these, thinking like oh my gosh i can only imagine yeah. looking at that yeah it's so amazing and then just thinking about all these little tiny baby hyenas nibbling on these bones just to try and develop it it's just so sweet so yeah we think we think we found the first evidence of it in Britain hopefully um, and hopefully there's a paper with it at some point soon but who knows <laughs> so yeah that's that project and then um undergraduate I I kind of went really left field and went for corals so um complete because I'm really like I love mammals they're my favorite like they're just my favorite, you know, everyone goes, oh, what's your favorite dinosaur? And I go, oh, uh, yes, but, so mammals are like always my thing. So to go for corals at undergraduate is kind of a, a kind of left field choice for me. <laughs> and what I did with them was to, um, I sliced them all up quite thin, like the rocks with them in, sliced them all up and counted, um, the lines that you find in them. So you find in the corals that they have lines in between them. And these are lines that could be, inter they're called tabulae. And they are the um, skeletal elements that kind of help the coral grow along. And what I did is I measured the widths in between them and tried to identify what these widths could mean. So there are a few different ideas and, and thinking really of how it works. So they could be annual growth lines, they could be responses to environmental or seasonal changes. So, you know, if it got too hot, they would stop growing or, you know, that sort of stuff. And then also periods of faster and slower growth. So um, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks in this tiny little lab with my microscope, <laughs> measuring like with to like the finest, like not point whatever millimeters, just trying to identify something. And um <laughs> I didn't really find any answers and I know that's like typical undergraduate kind of thing you know you don't really find massive stuff um but yeah so we kind of ended it going well it could be because of a storm the reason why there are fluctuations or it could be because it was quite a shallow water environment so yeah that's undergraduate and now science technician so <laughs> Incredible. And I also like that you just went through your entire life story because it makes my questioning so much easier because usually guests will be like, oh, yes, this is what I've done. And that's it. But you can tell you're very passionate about it because, yeah, what you gave all of us was exceptional. So bow down to you for that one. <laughs> Thank you. I just seem to waffle on quite a lot. It makes my job easier. Um, yeah. OK. <laughs> OK, so we have that question's asked. That question's asked. Um, I like that you also like mentioned your nibbling sticks. So I did make a note about that. And I thought that was really cute because like I'm working with little puppies right now and it's really cute to watch them teeth and everything. Yeah. So I read nibbling sticks. I was like, oh my God, can I just imagine baby hyenas nibbling on sticks? I think. Oh, it's, fabulous. you know, that they're, oh, they're just so sweet. And, you know, you can just picture it and go, oh, wow, that's so lovely just to think about it. I mean, Quite a lot of people are scared of hyenas, so you go, oh yeah, baby hyenas, and they go, ugh. <laughs> but yeah. Dinosaur, and people would probably go, oh, yeah, baby dinosaur, oh, <laughs> <laughs> or puppies, oh. All those are cute. Um, like with your nibbling sticks, obviously like you had mentioned because of COVID, you had to start like looking at archival material, looking at museums, doing literature reviews. I've had a lot of guests previously kind of talk about the importance of including that in research because you can't mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't excavate. Um, what was your experience like getting to go in there and working with archives? And yeah, so with it, it was I kind of did three trips to museum before COVID hit, and then afterwards, you know, it was 
I'd sent out all these emails previously, like, can I please see your collection catalogs just so that I could get my brain into where do I need to go first? What's the best place to start with? How many caves has this collection got? How many has this got, you know? And so I was quite lucky in the fact that quite a lot of them replied saying, oh yeah, here you go, this is it. Or here you can find it on here. So um, it was it was quite nice to actually be in a museum for about three, I went in for three like day long things. I found the nibbling sticks, obviously. <laughs> um, I was also kind of like my first proper time working in an archive as well. So um, I kind of was like, oh, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Um, but in the end, you know, I was kind of focused in on what I was looking for. I was looking for teeth, teeth patterns that match hyenas. There are um, these things called crenulations on the end of bones, which were when the bones had been broken to obtain marrow. Um, that, you know, there was this one, um, the, there was this tiny little jawbone about like tiny. And from the dentition, me and my supervisor went, that looks hyenid, you know, because they've got a really, really um, identifiable dentition. You go, oh, maybe that's quite similar. And about a week beforehand, I went to Creswell Crags, the museum there, and they've got this perfectly preserved fully articulated skeleton of a of a natal hyena and I went oh I recognize this jaw like oh it's possible hyena so that's what we put it down to you know possible hyena and there was other bones in there that said possible cut marks you know because humans would have occupied these uh, these caves as well um and you know I, I was like no these don't look right these look like the gaps between the height so yeah it was really interesting doing that sort of stuff um and then as COVID hit you know it kind of relied more on collections and um like the actual catalogs so you can't really get as much detail out as you want to and also like for example one of the museums they have over 30,000 uh, specimens from one cave and only 10,000 of them have been put into the online database so yeah, archives are amazing and collections are amazing, but at the same time, the detail would be quite like nice to have because it could also present biases. And so for example, you have all these bones. So you have a bison bone, a hyena bone, a mammoth bone, blah, blah, blah. But the bison bone might be gnawed, but we don't know. We don't know whether it's a natal bone, like not a natal bone, but like an, whether it's been gnawed by a natal or by an adult you know and it's quite because it's missing quite a lot of detail you don't get as much stuff I guess it's different in other um like fields where you can kind of go oh that's a book great let's read it all or like oh there's only like a page missing but if online catalogues they don't tend to have as much detail as you want and I'm pretty sure you probably find that all the time as well so yeah. <laughs> that context, isn't it? Like the moment the context is missing, then all you can do is just look at it for what it is. And you don't have what it's related to or what necessarily associated with. And you just look at it going, well, it's a tooth. But if we could have said, oh, that tooth was embedded in the yeah. home, well, then we already have 10 times more information than we do just by looking at the tooth. But yeah. Yeah, archives are so backed up with cataloging. And obviously back in the day, our research methods were vastly oh tell me about it like we have um quite a lot of um quite a lot of victorian scientists you know going around and you probably have the same as well in egyptology and in archaeology as well <laughs> but we had quite so in my field especially we had you know people going in getting oh big bear skull let's get the bear let's get the hyena skull let's get this but overlook the smaller things you know like the rabbits or the the foxes or whatever could have been brought in or oh it's just a bit of prey bone chuck it away and um that's the problem as well and that there is rumors of one victorian um excavator using dynamite so <laughs> to just open up the caves as a whole and also quite a lot like it was only one there's a collector at, at creswell there's been like a big history of excavation which is amazing and um one person developed his um, 
he developed his excavation system there. So he did it by meter, by meter, by meter. And he was like, yeah, this is where it's from. This is the bed it's from. Great. But his predecessors were like, yeah, let's just dig and dig and dig and find if we've got a cave bear skull, let's take the cave bear skull and don't care about anything else. And I only want the mammoth and, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of like who can get the best, the best and the biggest and then sell it, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. It was basically like a treasure hunt back then, where they were, was, as much as they said, oh, yeah. It's like, is it, is it, you just want to say, oh, I found this thing and it looks like this. I'm great. Versus, like, yeah, I found this thing and now I can learn more about it and no one's going to remember my name, but at least I did a nice thing. We yeah. mentioned dynamite. We had someone I used to work in Belize and that was a thing, like old school archaeologists. Oh my God. People that top the pyramid mounds and then they would just blow it up so they could get into the pyramid. But of course, <laughs> all the architecture, if any, yeah. all they didn't really care. But no, I think I, every field, is, it seems like with the Victorians, they just decided to blow everything up, find the best thing, and then show yeah. it off into the cabinet of curiosities. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, oh, let's go collect, <laughs> let's go collect this today. Oh, I feel like being an archaeologist today. Let's go here and oh, let me flaunt my money around and go to Egypt and buy a pyramid. <laughs> let's eat oh, a mummy. God. Yes. Hmm. Winston, I can't carry this pyramid home. Quick, bring me a mummy. I need to I need to have a drink and a think. <laughs> oh god. Yep. Uh, love I love our ancestors so much. They made oh, things yes, exactly. definitely yeah. easier for us. <laughs> well, it's good to know that even through all of that, you successfully got to your masters. Like you you yeah. did it, did a thing. <laughs> very proud how was that process for you to be able to finally like submit that research that you've worked so hard on especially after COVID um it was all right that's the best way to explain it like um I did a viva in August and so I had quite a lot of corrections to go through because um <laughs> I wrote a lot I wrote a lot a lot like 40 40 plus thousand words you know in you know it could have just been like 20,000 but, you know, I was just like, yeah, let's write everything because COVID impacted me a lot and I'm going to write this and, you know, it needs all this context and everyone needs to know the four types of hyenas, even though they probably know what they look like. They need to know everything. They need to know all the way excavation history when they don't, when I could just go, oh, read, blah, 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 et al, whatever. So that was kind of like a lot of the corrections. And then I finally handed it in three days before Christmas. So 22nd. Because, um, yeah, I just, I've, I've been working as well because I started my full-time job. So it was quite like, oh, I have to do this and then this and then this and then this. So, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like spinning loads of plates at once and hoping not for, for them not to fall. But, yeah, it was, it was actually all right. So I learnt loads and I really enjoyed it. And Manchester's just a lovely, lovely place, the paleo. <laughs> think um now that you've done that i know you mentioned eventually doing the phd do you think you're going to stick with the same topic and then be able to write your forty thousand words do you think you're going to expand <laughs> um i just i don't know i have to see whatever i find interesting you know just apply for the ones that i'm like oh yeah actually that sounds really interesting and you know it could be something completely different or it could just be something on mammals that i've not done before but yeah i just want to do whatever makes me happy you know what i mean and if it if it interests me, I'm like, yeah, let's do that. And if it's funded, even better. <laughs> yes, I think that tends to be a lot of professionals kind of conundrum. Like, yeah. I want to get the PhD one day, but not only are they expensive at times, so um, expensive. but they put your life up and there's not that kind of funding there. So no. you have like, what impact can you make as a researcher now? And will that PhD benefit that in some way in the future? Like, you know, do you still want to keep building towards it? And when yeah build towards that like what can you do with it yeah exactly yeah <laughs> I did see um like looking through your your cv you also scuba dive and I was gonna have to ask the question do you think you might ever try to go and combine the two loves of prehistory and scuba diving and do some type of like paleo archaeology underwater yeah like uh, that would be a dream I mean I've not scuba dived in a while due to covid um and also just having to be BZAP trained and PADI trained, you know, I need to actually re-get back into it. But um, I can go down to about 40 metres. That's like the max you can go because I'm 
you know I started doing that when I was about nine just because I went to Egypt with my family on a holiday and I was like yeah let's try it absolutely loved it and I was like yep this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life (laughs) but because of COVID I've just not been able to for a while and during uni it was expensive so I couldn't do it either um because the society it was like oh 200 quid just to join and I'm like nope <laughs> let's not do that um not in Manchester at Portsmouth um you know so I was just like yeah I'm just gonna have to sit out for a bit but you know hopefully sooner but yeah I would love to combine the two you know um just I think that'll be so much fun <laughs> just so much fun it would be an incredible opportunity because like I know like I'm the same as you like I have my scuba certification for about 40 meters I think it is um and it, someone asked me about that as well like would you ever combine it I'm like of course I would love to oh, it's yeah. just like, doing it um and I know like you obviously deal with hyena cave dens basically so it would probably come in handy if any of them are flooded on the coast because yeah you might not exactly there and, and you find a cave and you're like oh there's hyenas actually in the water guys yeah exactly. that would be amazing um there's a there's a cave called wookie hole and that's quite a big one in in uh Ch- it's near cheddar gorge in somerset and it was completely filled with water so you can learn to do cave diving there and it's like oh that would be amazing um and what it was, it was flooded. Um, so they, Victorian scientists, you know, dynamited an area to allow for water to pass through this underwater cave system to um, get to a paper mill. This is a really weird story. So the, pa- the water is like amazingly clear and they found a hyena den once they dynamited this side of the, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And then like a few meters down the like ravine, there's another one and another one um um so yeah it's really cool and I would love to combine them um I I don't know if I would do you know that like you know if you go through a cave and there's those tiny little holes yeah I don't know if I could do that underwater because like that would stress me out (laughs) because believe it or not I'm actually really claustrophobic yeah I scuba dive (laughs) it's really stupid but um like it's such a weird mesh of two things but yeah, so I did, I don't know if I could fit through a tiny little gap underwater with all my gear. <laughs> I know I could, but it's just you're gonna have to like try in an Olympic sized pool. They're gonna have like yeah. a little tube to go through, and then you can at least know if you get stuck and just lift the tube out of the water and be like, it's Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I went caving um, in Belize. So I did like cave research for Belizean archaeology for the Maya. And That's I remember so cool. them going like, okay there's a tiny hole that you can crawl through and it gets you into a big room and you can do that um but there's like a longer way up and around that I will take everyone else through like what yeah. you guys want to do. and I was the only person that was like tiny hole let's go <laughs> and I got this tiny hole it's only one way and no one is in this gallery when I get there and I was wow. like I a wrong turn like I'm just by myself and eventually <laughs> they come up and they come down and everyone's like wow that must be so cool not being claustrophobic and I was like I didn't know if I was or not that was the trial yeah. <laughs> like why would you make that your trial and like what else am I yeah. gonna be in a hole in the dark like I don't do that on daily so no exactly <laughs> that sounds so but cool it is it's really cool and obviously like if you ever did do cave diving eventually there are a lot of caves in Belize that I think you would also probably just love to go in is- oh defo it's on my it's on one of my like to go to you know like one of my big lists you know I've got probably stacks and stacks of lists of going like yeah I want to do that there I want to go there and go here and Iceland and this one and this one (laughs) yeah (laughs) but because of COVID obviously (laughs) yeah it's one of those things where obviously like our professions allow us to travel and I think COVID Mm. just definitely derailed all of that so I'm like I have these I have like this degree I love these degrees that I have And I got them so I could travel. And now I'm just sitting at my house reading books, which I still like, but I want to read a book on the plane to go somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm the exact same. (laughs) So with obviously all all your research, all your degrees now that you get to say you have. um, I know, (laughs) it's so exciting. To like want to get into this, what kind of advice would you say is helpful for everyone from you know obviously very little interested person in paleontology up to an adult who might want to change their career path um so I just think like 
always believe in yourself like I know it sounds really cliche but that's like a big one for me but also like just never stop loving dinosaurs and like paleo and always pursue because I believe for me anyone's a paleontologist like if you go fossil hunting you're a paleontologist because you go fossil hunting amazing you found an ammonite well good amazing you know well is and up to PhDs and postdocs and PIs and super everyone I'm like wow yeah great go on everyone <laughs> and, and um, I think the thing is to get into it you should just never stop being into it so you know as a kid I loved all the BBC walking with series and you know <laughs> like all the tv shows Jurassic Park I love it I know that's quite oh my god the paleontologist actually likes pa uh, Jurassic Park <gasps> oh my god shock <laughs> but yeah so I just think the people to get into it from maybe like a young age go to your museums go you know a big one for me was to learn to draw that's a big one <laughs> like you you kind of need to draw a little bit just even if it's just a quick sketch like just go draw an ammonite go draw a trilobite amazing and then um as you kind of go up through to high school just science and geography so I did my A levels I did geology which is a big one like if you can get geology great uh biology so I didn't do biology I did geology psychology geography they were my a levels um but either way geology biology great routes to start either way geology biology great routes to start and even if you do like a completely different undergrad you know if you do geology or if you do whatever you can still find a way into paleo so um one of my friends she did geology undergraduate she's now doing a paleo masters probably going to move on to I don't know something else just because she likes moving around and I think she's also doing geophysics I don't know I'm not yeah so no she did geology undergraduate then redid and did paleo undergraduate and then moved to a geophysics masters there we go that's it um so you know quite a lot of bouncing around and you know do your online courses do just read stuff read all the books um there's so many good paleo books out you know and even if you go onto Twitter or go onto blogs or whatever, you will find a good list of books to read. Um, yeah, you, you know, there's just loads of ways to get into it. Like there's um, a professional paleontologist called Dean. He, um, he didn't do undergraduate or masters in paleontology, but he's doing a PhD, but he's like amazing. Everyone in the world knows him. He's in paleontology, but he's doing a PhD, but he's like amazing. Everyone in the world knows him. You know, he, um, I don't know if you saw, but you know the giant ichthyosaur that was found a few months ago? Yeah, he was one of the lead paleontologists on it. But he, yeah, he um, he didn't have any formal background in it. And um, you find that quite a lot. You know, there's, um, there's a guy down in Dorset. He's a plumber by trade, but he's opened up his own museum. So anyone can get into it. It's just, you know, keep doing what you love. That sounds really cliche, but yeah. <laughs> So especially we all know in classical academia um there's like that gatekeeping acts aspect oh yeah kind of, definitely i mean you feel it even if you're at the top of academia you're going to feel if you're outside academia and i think that is a good like thing to think about is just always enjoy it don't stop enjoying it just because someone yeah. says you're not qualified enough or you your research doesn't fit into what we're looking for it's like no if you enjoy it you can yeah be a part of it and there is nothing stopping you from doing that yeah exactly it's like for me paleo art paleo art is such a huge thing in the community you know you get amazing paleo artists but for me even just drawing a dinosaur you know even a kid just drawing a t-rex or whatever is paleo art and I know that's you know it's not professional or anything but for me that's still a kid going oh wow I want to draw a t-rex so I'm going to draw a t-rex and yeah so it's just kind of harboring and encouraging it almost so you just need to continue con encouraging it say for example if I had a kid that was obsessed with I don't know dinosaurs I'd still go yeah do it do it or what you know what I mean so <laughs> it's just encouragement that's all you I need like <laughs> and we're going to encourage your your love now for Jurassic my final question is the new trailer dropped for the Jurassic World Dominion 
what are your thoughts? Because I might be a little too obsessed with the original cast coming back for their final installment. So let's have a paleontologist tell us just how she is about everything that we are. Okay, so I've watched it about 15,000 times now. <laughs> so I, I love it. I really, really like it. Um, I love the original cast. I think I, I kind of, a tear came out when Ellie Sattler turned around. I was like, oh my God, I love you. Because she was like the OG woman in paleo. In my head, I was like, wow, I want to be like Ellie Sattler. Even though she's a paleobotanist, like I want to be like her. And, you know, <laughs> Alan Grant and Jeff Goldblum, I love Jeff Goldblum. Like everyone loves Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> um, I think I went to go watch it with a lot of my paleo friends in undergraduate. And <laughs> you know that scene when Jeff Goldblum's just lying there like that? Yeah, like that. Everyone was like, yes! Going, Jeff! Like, we love you! <laughs> so I think everyone's like really excited about it. I know I am, definitely. They've changed um, scientific director, I think. They've gone to um, a guy called Steve Brissette. Brissette? Brissette. Brissette. And he's up in Edinburgh. He, um, he's just really cool. He's so good with dinosaurs. Um, they used to have a guy called Jack Horner who did a lot of work on um, T-Rex and he, um, he, I think it's him that did the Chickenosaurus. So he like tried to genetically modify a chicken to be a, a dinosaur really because yeah, that, you know, avians came from theropod dinosaurs. So yeah, I, I'm just so excited by it all. Um, the... <sighs> The one thing that kind of bugs me, and I know this is going to sound petty, but you know when Claire's under the water, the ginger lady's under the water, and there's that giant three like claw thing. So that's called Therizinosaurus, and we know that they're actually just herbivores, and the claws are for defense. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to call it now. You know, he's going to be under the water, and he'll just take a drink. That's it. I'm excited about. <sighs> I'm a bit confused about how Bloom is able to reproduce, like have the baby Velociraptor, but you know, um, I I just I think it's so cool. I mean, there there are quite a lot of things that Jurassic Park got wrong, and I think they've carried it on. So, for example, Velociraptors they are huge; they shouldn't be that big. <laughs> um, so they're actually the size of a dinosaur that we know called um, Deinonychus. Dinicus, Dinicus, I think it is. And um, they're a bit bigger. They are Velociraptor size in the first Jurassic Park. And typical Velociraptors would have been about the size of a turkey and tiny, you know, they're like ah, pack animals. So aggressive every time I yeah. they just want to eat. <laughs> yeah, probably the same with geese. <laughs> so um, that's like one of the big things. And, you know, Paleontology has come such a long way since the first one. So, for example, we've found like more feathered dinosaurs. Um, we, they've included Asdarchids, which are those giant, you know, that giant pterosaur that came on, which I just, they're so cool. Like these giant pterosaurs with like 13 meter wingspans, just massive. But they've included the little tufts of, fe of feather, like proto feathers, which is just great because, you know, Many people see pterosaurs as just scaly, skinny things, but no, they have like little tufts of hair, which I just think is great. I don't know. I just I'm a big fan. Like I know for a fact that I will go see it first first night, opening night. I'll probably reserve the whole cinema if I could. <laughs> just you know, sit there rewatching it and go, yeah, I like that. I like that. And kind of the one thing that so my favorite dinosaur is Parasaurolophus. You know the ones with the big head crest. And um, to see them running with the horses just made me so happy that, I don't know, it's just something that I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, I I think it's, I'm, I'm excited for it, but I think that's just me. I know there are quite a lot of, not quite a lot of, I know there are a few people that have been like, oh, Jurassic Park. And I know that there are quite a few, like, paleo fanboys, I'd call them, but they're probably not all fanboys. But they're always like, oh, no, you know, everything that this one person says is right and this person's wrong. And it, they go onto Twitter and it's a lot of, you know, discrediting actual paleo, paleontologists and stuff. So, yeah, like 
Spinosaurus is a huge one for the paleo committee, uh, community, not committee, committee, community. Like I, it should be a committee, yeah. So uh, Spinosaurus is constantly changing. I think there's about four papers, like a year on it. I just kind of tune it out. I just go, la, 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 no Spinosaurus for me, thank you. Um, because this part does really well though, is they, they always say like, oh, if it doesn't look like how it's supposed to, it's because we've mixed DNA. Oh yeah, defo. Yeah, we've mixed a frog and this and this and yeah I mean I'm currently <laughs> I'm currently playing the game of it you know the um evolution one so you can buy you can make it like a zoo and oh, I just love it so much it's so good um me and my partner play it all the time <laughs> probably like every night we just we're on it like yeah let's let's put in the new brachiosaur and let's put it in with this and you know so <laughs> I'm just a big fan. I'm a fan girl of anything like that, though. So, yeah, I like that. I think always stay passionate, and even even though you could become the head of all of paleontology, never lose what made you love it so much. Yeah, exactly. You could know everything about dinosaurs and still not know everything. And exactly, and new things come up every day, every year. You know, so yeah. <laughs> Just enjoy what you can enjoy and don't exactly i think that's a great segue into our game so stay tuned guys and we'll start that soon thank you exciting so here we go this is our game um again i did give you a sneak preview i said it was you know a little bit possible field trip so i heard you're nervous please don't be nervous i'm not that terrible <laughs> So as you can see, yes, we have Fossil Field Trip with Save Cultural Heritage Group. Obviously, this is Weekend Talk, again, with Save Cultural Heritage Group. Far right, you can see that there's six questions here. So we'll go through each one. And again, don't worry if you don't know, but your <laughs> lifeline is your Twitter. So if you can okay. access your Twitter at any point, that's your phone a friend. Your friend is yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. So then let's see this. Image one. There you go. Yeah, okay. So that's my most recent po post. Um, mm -hmm. That is, oh my God, that is Co Coprodon, I think it is. Um, I think that's Excellent. the name. Um, and they're just so cool. They're, for, they're just, I love the Eocene. So the Eocene is the kind of second period after the death of the dinosaurs. So it's kind of like when most mammalian families were like starting out. So we get, pretty much all of the whale evolution in the Eocene. We get all of the elephant evolution in the Eocene. So yeah, they are just so cool. And then this um, fossil's from a place called Gruber Mesel. And that is a place in Germany. And it is just the nicest fossil locality. <laughs> I know that's, um, yeah, so it preserves fur organs. There's even um, a horse fossil, like a paleo horse um, that has a fetus inside of it. It is wow. so cool. Yeah. That yeah, is impressive. Yeah. I just got excited that this looked adorable because if I go back to the previous slide, it looks menacing. Yeah. And then the teeth. <laughs> yes. And then I found that it was just this adorable squirrel looking thing. And I yeah. think that that alone made my day. <laughs> but excellent. Yeah, I, you you yeah. survived that first round. <laughs> so now we have round two. Are you ready? Okay. Yep. Defo go okay so that is um i think that's leptic tidium and oh no <laughs> <laughs> it's okay but i know you probably know all the facts uh yeah there so the thing is there's so many little shrew-like creatures that they all just <laughs> oh, exactly. i said it was it's such so it was such like yeah that's it that's so annoying <laughs> damn it that's completely fine you tell us about them though that is, i'll give you that you can you can redeem yourself um so macrocranian is um a tiny like omnivore shrew-like mammal um i don't really know too much about it but so with it it says with the fact that you've just put up saying at the time of its discovery these fossil remains indicated the specimen had eaten fish near the time of its death so What's interesting about the locality that it was found in is that it was a volcanic lake. So wow. this whole environment was like a rainforest and this lake um, had quite a lot of CO2 upwellings and the CO2 came up kind of out into the forest, killed everything. 
apart from the small mammals because the small mammals could usually avoid it um and yeah so it's just really interesting that it kind of is about this whole fossil lake scenario and this lake killed them all like they relied on it so heavily for water but it was ultimately its demise so yeah it's That's really crazy. weird to think that germany had a volcanic background i think it's weird to me that you know most places had volcanoes <laughs> but yeah germany especially being one so yeah um, it's always interesting when you find out where all the volcanoes are you're like okay cool i won't go there then uh yeah like go back in time <laughs> yeah so it's, they're okay. really interesting animals animals you did okay. it though that was that was so good you you knew facts <laughs> and more fun facts than i could find which is why you are the experts and i'm oh. here. <laughs> but yeah you got you got image three now you ready again okay. Uh, <laughs> okay so this is my favorite bird this is one called gastornis um geisel talensis geisel yeah so these are it's just the coolest bird it's my favorite bird they're flightless um and they were the kind of like, it was thought that they were um, meat eaters for a while. Um, and then kind of re new like parameters were found of them. And they thought, oh, actually it's probably more likely that they were herbivores and they ate all the seeds and the nuts and stuff that were on the forest floor. And these were big creatures. Like I remember taking that photo and I just had to, I had to go like, Doo. okay, yep, that looks okay. Yeah, I guess that looks okay. <laughs> you know and then I stitched it all together and I was like god that is a massive bird like I think it's so cool and there's um it's like I don't know it's just a massive bird that you just wouldn't expect to find and um so these types of birds are pretty quite common during the um common during the Cenozoic which is the period that we're in now and the you know you get them all around the world and the kind of most Close really related ones are the ratites. I think that's what they are. The um, emus, the ostriches, and the um, cassowaries and rheas, I think it is. So yeah, it's really cool. And you can get, you find them in um, South America, you find them in um, Germany, and this is quite a iconic species, I would say. <laughs> and this bird was like the first bird that I remember seeing on TV because my um, parents are really into paleo. Um, they love they love BBC um, Walking With series. And I like my first, this is gonna sound really bad, but my first memory was this one called Walking With Beasts. And the first episode focuses on this locality, this um, this um, group of metal locality. And um, the one thing, this is gonna sound really bad, the one thing that horrified me as a child, right, was because of this bird. And in, the, in this show, I don't know if you've seen it, but in the show, they, it has an egg and it goes out it leaves it for an hour or so and these ants come and eat the egg and you see the baby chick just eaten by ants and it was like so terrifying to me as a child <laughs> I oh think my god a four-year-old and I was like ah, oh my god ants ew no, no 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 you know and so when I got to see it in the flesh I was like oh okay yeah <laughs> so, oh my god such a random thing that you know you associate with things now so yeah that's <laughs> imagine like you're in like a therapy session you're like what is your fear like what is the thing you fear the most you're like I, honestly like if I was an egg and I was getting eaten by ants yeah like, that's, <laughs> that's my biggest fear at like, that point imagine I'm like... a baby bird and <laughs> my mum goes out and <laughs> And they'll be like, a uh, fear of abandonment, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. And then they look at your record, they're like, oh, paleontologist. Okay, yeah, so just, with just paleo. Yeah, defo. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's I, really cool. They're just such cool. Like, they are my favourite birds, hands down. Favourite extinct birds. And, amazing. <laughs> I'm glad that so far this game has now traumatised half of our audience <laughs> and gave them a new fear that they never knew they had. <laughs> just need to go watch Walking with Beasts. Like, I highly recommend it. It's my favorite TV show. Guys, paleontology is now. cool and fun. <laughs> oh, we're going to survive the game, I promise. Yeah. We have image four. I won't bring up any more traumatic experiences. <laughs> oh, man. All right, here we go then. Okay, so this is, um, oh my God, I know this. Um, it was. <sighs> It's one from China. 
I will. I'm going to have a look now. <laughs> so it, it's from China and it was found, it was in the Dinosaur of China exhibit that I went to. Sinraptor, Sinraptor, I think it is. Oh. Yeah, it has like a really crazy name, but yeah. Guan, yeah, Guan Long. Um, I'm getting all my dinosaurs confused. That's why I'm a Malian person. Exactly. Um, Fine. <laughs> so um, I remember seeing this at a place called Dinosaurs of China, and it was in a um, museum in Nottingham called Wallenton, Wallenton Hall. And it's really weird. That's the place that Batman's filmed. Wallenton Hall is oh, Batman's like house. That weird fact yeah <laughs> just we, we move on from it but it's actually a museum and what they did with this um exhibit was they got all of the dinosaurs that had been found from dino uh, from dinosaurs china and mongolia and they brought it in kind of like they just brought it over to the uk and were like yeah this is where we are we're going to do this and it was just a stunning exhibit so um guanlong is a feathered dinosaur and I don't know if we know that it's a feathered dinosaur. I think we do, but everyone depicts it with feathers. Um, it's from the Jurassic period, which is the um, middle part of the Mesozoic. So the Mesozoic is three different time periods. You kind of think, oh, Mesozoic equals Cretaceous. It also equals the Triassic, Jurassic and the Cretaceous, but we kind of know it as the age of dinosaurs. Um, and Guanlong is kind of an early, t-rex ancestor and we know that we there are people that believe that t-rexes emigrated from um asia into north america but i don't know too much about it because again not really a big dinosaur person um but yeah it's so cool like just i am in awe of dinosaurs like i just i love them so much i'm like wow that's so incredible that they they walked on this earth um yeah so the thing is with with the thing is with chinese fossils and asian fossils is that they kind of only started to come out into public knowledge into about 1996 i think it was so quite recently wow. that everyone this giant asian fossil boom has kind of kicked off and they are just some absolutely amazingly preserved fossils from um east asia so you get the feathered dinosaurs and that's how we knew that dinosaurs had feathers because we've also got these really nicely preserved like feathers and dinosaurs with feathers and then birds with feathers so we've kind of got before before um the chinese fossils came out we kind of only knew archaeopteryx as the one fossil that had feathers and we're like oh yeah that's a birdie dinosaur halfway point but these chinese fossils have kind of expanded and gone yeah it was Archaeopteryx is here on the scale, and then we've got all of the birds. So, yeah, it's it's so cool. <laughs> I love that there's this extra fun fact with every single one of these. So, like, obviously, I don't think a lot of the audience would have known that, like, the Asian boom of dinosaurs is a very <laughs> recent thing, and that like we can attribute that to how we understand feathers to be on dinosaurs. Yeah. Like, let alone those are great fun facts that obviously would not have made it into this presentation. But I am now bowing down to you once again for all of your knowledge. <laughs> Just to make up for the fact that I'm getting all the species wrong and the dinosaurs I mean, wrong. <laughs> that's fine. There's so many of them. I think you're allowed to mix them up. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. I mix up my friends all the time, so it's fine. <laughs> I mix up my brothers. <laughs> that's fine, then. See, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have image five now. You're almost okay. there. Okay, so this is, um, I think it's Paleochiroptrix. So it's a bat fossil from the Mesal locality. And um, I just love bats. They are just the coolest little things. And these fossils are just incredible. These are from the same locality as the Gastornis from the Macrocranian and the um, uh, Copoidon. And these are just tiny, tiny little things. They're about that big. And, you know, you can still see the wing membrane, the fur, like that black outline um, around the bones is the um, is the fur. And then you can see where the wings would have been. I I don't know. There's just something too special to me about that. And you can see it's a little ear and oh, it's just so cute. Like this is just such a nice fossil. And 
it's weird because in this locality bats are like one of the best known creatures from there so they um at this locality just bats are one of the most well-preserved mammals and i don't know why but there's just so many bat fossils and and this is just from one museum and there are a few museums with the locality collections in so it would be really nice to go back to germany and go to all these collections and there are um some really interesting things about paleochiropteryx so as you've written here they um they can echolocate so this is kind of like the first evidence of echolocation in the fossil record and yeah it's just i really like them and then there are other examples of paleochiropteryx um that have fossil stomach contents and um yeah and look i just i love that little ear i keep going back onto it but it's just the tiny little ear and i'm like oh it feels so cute but the thing is with bats is that quite we've got quite a few people working on them and they're still a bit like we don't really know when they first arose we don't really know when they just yeah because they're so small and fragile that their bones will have just been so disarticulated or you know just chuck you know you just wouldn't know um whereas we're quite lucky with gruber mesel because it's this place it's an oil shale and what it is is that you kind of so I've been to Gruber Mesel and we did do some oil shale. I found a leaf. I, I think I cried a bit because I was like, oh my God, I found a leaf. Wow. You know, whereas my friends found a fish. <laughs> I was just so happy with my leaf. <laughs> no, leaf is cool. <laughs> Leaves are well cool. But um, yeah, so these oil shales are like paper thin. Like, so for example, with the oil, it would be like this and it's really finely laminated. And all you have to do is kind of get, we got big machetes and just peel back one of the layers and then the fossil's there. And what you'd have to do is dunk it straight into water, into oil, because it's an oil shale. And if you leave it out in the sun, which I did with my leaf, um, because it wasn't like impressive enough. <laughs> it was just like a tiny little leaf. But I took loads of photos of it before um, I got, before, so with the oil shale, it dries up and it just crumbles up and it just goes, so it's really cool. It's a really, really interesting locality, really cool animals. <laughs> um, there's quite a lot of things in Germany. Um, Germany wise is great for paleo. Just putting it out there. If any German paleontologists are listening, <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah, this is Paleochiropteryx and it's one of my favorite fossils ever. <laughs> I like how you mentioned its ear because in this image, it looks like it's wearing a party hat and it's very oh, excited it's so to be a part cool. of this game. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, they're just, oh, I just I look at it and I go oh it's so cute <laughs> uh -huh. so, all feeling warm inside for our final image then are you ready okay yeah this cool. one you'll know I know you'll know 100% <laughs> you're not gonna have an issue you got okay it. so this is Eric the hyena um he is a fully articulated baby hyena fossil found at Cresswell Crags um and so his excavation history is a bit weird. So they found the bottom half first, I think. So I think, yeah, they found a part of him first in this tiny little cave called Pinhole. And it's really narrow, it's about a meter across. And um, he was kind of under some rubble, not rubble, but you know, like cave debris. And so they found the first half and they went, oh, wow, okay, this is interesting. And then um, I think it was about 60 years later, another excavation happened and they found the rest of him and he's just so well preserved he's just astounding like you can see all his little teeth um i think they reckon him to be about six months old at the time um and he yeah he died in that position so he's just wow. a lovely i know that sounds really morbid but he's a lovely specimen and he's I mean, the one that i base um he's the one that i base the um you know how i mentioned earlier the tiny little teeth that i found in in the collections yeah his mandibles are the ones that I based it off and I was like oh he's so cute um so yeah it's really Aww. interesting about hyenas living in the ice age because you just they're just so weird like I love hyenas so much and then ice age hyenas were a tiny so they're the, they're the exact same species as the ones that we have today but they're just a bit bigger so they're a meter tall at the shoulder um which is larger by like I think a few inches than today's hyenas and they were like the main scavengers they they were probably our 
ancestors most um similar niche wise to us so it's like competitors that's the word so there's evidence of um hyenas eating neanderthals um which is really really weird and really interesting because you wouldn't really put those two together you wouldn't really put a neanderthal with a hyena because you would it, you know quite a lot of people think oh they're just today's extant animals um yeah so i just love them they're so cool and eric is just amazing he's so well articulated because these bones are so tiny and especially with baby hyenas they're so easily fragile like these bones are so fragile you know in adults their um their bones are a bit more robust because you know they're adults <laughs> whereas for in natal and uh, young hyenas their bones would just be so easily destroyed that there would just be no evidence which is kind of what i found in my project that you know there might have been a baby hyena here but we just wouldn't have known so yeah yeah, yeah they're just oh, such a lovely lovely specimen <laughs> yeah i saw him too and i was like oh my god that's adorable because when you just look at him like that you're like well look at him he's just chilling yeah he's, he's straight up vibing <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's living so his best sweet. life. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, you survived. You Thank did you. it. You you survived our fossil field trip. I didn't lose any kids on this adventure. I might have given them some PTSD with some <laughs> eggs and ants, but other than that, I think they did a great job. <laughs> yeah. So I got I think four out of six. <laughs> but you still knew facts about every single one of them, and that's what we like. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Very proud. Again, another bow. The audience has to bow. Give us a like spike at the at the end of this video because, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> well then, since you survived, yeah, <laughs> since you survived, we now get to roll out the red carpet for you. So if you could let everyone know where to find you on social media. Yeah, definitely. Going on. Anything else? Um, you want to so let me. Sorry, I just need to get my services up. So, um, this is all on the like the slides as well so um your main way of finding me is really on twitter so i'm quite big on twitter like i love going on twitter and it's um jenna davers at, 20, uh, at jenna davers 22 and um with a capital j and a capital d um yeah i've also just recently uh, made an instagram account so that i'm i'll be sharing more and more fossils um yeah, so hit me up on that. It's exactly the same, but with an under. Oh no, it's paleo underscore scene, um, which is it's also all on my Twitter, and I also have a blog, which again is on my Twitter. But that is um, it's probably easier just to go through it through that. And on that, I um like do book reviews and conference reviews, um, yeah. So and then put photos of fossils and. You know, there's more to come on that, but it's just been a bit hectic with work and dissertation stuff. And um, people I want to shout out, there's um, Paleontologists Against Systematic Racism, which is quite a big prevalent thing at the moment in paleo. So give them a follow on Twitter. Um, they're just doing great work. Um, PaleoCast is a podcast based on paleo and I listen to them pretty much every morning if I get the chance to <laughs> um they've got some really really interesting talks with loads and loads of interesting guests so hopefully I'll be on them on there one day <laughs> um and, and their most recent one is on Burmese amber which again is a really touchy subject in paleo at the moment because um at the moment it's kind of funding a lot of things that are going on there so uh the, the amber not just yeah um also shout out to the Palace, the Paleontological Association, just because they're great. And also ICAL Manchester, which is my uh, department at the moment. So yeah, you'll see these all on the slides. <laughs> um, just give me a follow on Twitter if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> or mean, Instagram or Everyone anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it was fantastic to have you. And I learned a lot. I can only imagine how much other people have learned. I hope they all now fossils and think adorable because like yeah. nine times out of ten now I'm going to be like oh my god that is so cute but yeah thank you so much for coming on our show today obviously for the audience if you like this type of content and obviously if you liked Jenna then please give us a like 
And if you want to see more, then give us a follow because we post twice a month, every other week uh, on Fridays and we have fun here. At least I think Jenna had fun. Did we I have fun? lots of fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well then, until next episode, thank you guys so much for watching and see you later. Bye.